Hi, everyone. I'm Laura Wexler, and I'm one of the co-founders and co-producers of the Stoop Storytelling Series. How many of you are familiar with the Stoop? Some of you? I know we have a lot of jhsph.edu emails on our email list. So um, we love that public health people love the Stoop, and it's really a delight to be here. I first want to um, get another round of applause for Mark Meadows. He's actually, um, as well as a lovely piano player, he's a um, graduate of both Peabody Institute and Johns Hopkins, um, so he's an alum. <laughs> And he's going to be playing a featured song uh, later in the show. So that'll be great. Um, and I use the word show um, very deliberately. Hopefully the piano playing um, signaled to you right at the top that this is not your typical academic lecture. Um, and not that there is a typical academic lecture, but this, is, this isn't uh, close to that. And though we do have the screen, we promise there will be no PowerPoint or anything like that. Because what's going to happen um, for the next hour or so is that these seven people are going to tell stories. And um, in telling their stories, they are going to invite you into their lives and their experience as um, people who work in this field. And um, you, who, who, as people who work in the field as well, I think we'll hear a lot of things that are familiar and also things that will be new. And hopefully that will be exciting for you. Um, we also want to let you know that there's an opportunity for some audience participation, um, which is um, about halfway through the show. Um, we're going to open it up for anybody in the audience to raise their hand and come up on stage and tell a three-minute um, story on, about your work in public health. So hopefully, if you're wanting to do that but feeling a little nervous, um, hearing these stories will, um, will give, you, give you some um, courage or some, some urging to come up here and do that. Um, so the, the concept of the stoop is really simple. We pick a theme, and in this case, it's, um, it's the theme of you know, public health as it's lived on the ground level, um, personal stories about working in public health. And then we find storytellers who would like to tell a true personal tale on that theme. So um, these folks were either volunteered or volunteered by other people to uh, do this, and they gamely engage in the process, which involves sort of just coming to um, a coaching session or talking on the phone and sort of like figuring out what a story, what a good story would be to tell in five minutes. And that's really how, um, how simple it is. Um, we, the, we at the Stoop have been doing this for about 10 years here in Baltimore. We do shows at the Senator Theater, and um, we would love to have you come to a show or tell a story at any one of our shows. And you can find out about the Stoop at stoopstorytelling.com. So I want to thank um, the, the folks on the committee for Alumni Day for inviting me. It's been such a pleasure to work with these folks and hear their stories. They're terrific stories. Public health stories are just, by definition, interesting stories where a lot is at stake, and it's been such a pleasure for me, and I know it will be for you. I want to introduce now Brian Simpson, who is editor of the Public Health um, Magazine, full of great stories, every issue is, and he's also um, an alum. He's a 2013, um, 2013 uh, Master of Public Health uh, graduate. So he's going to be introducing the storytellers, and um, I'll be here just to I don't know, just to see that everything goes OK and nobody faints, which has never really happened, really. Um, so here's Brian. Great. Thank you, Laura. And uh, thanks to the alumni committee and uh, Jimmy Lou, Morgan, and Jess for coming up with this fantastic idea of bringing Stoop Stories here to the school. Um, we have some amazing storytellers lined up and including um, some amazing music from the legendary Mark Meadows. Um, as noted uh, earlier today during the lunch, yesterday was a really big day here at the school uh, with the Bloomberg gift. It was a notable day in the school's history. I want to congratulate Dean Clagg, um, especially, or as he likes to be known now, the $300 million man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so looking back at this uh, esteemed audience of uh, my fellow alumni, I'm having a little bit of a flashback to my MPH classes. Once again, I'm the dumbest person in the room, but that's okay because um, I'm excited to be here because we are talking about two of my greatest passions, public health and storytelling. Uh, every day, well, almost every day, I come in to work eager and excited. Uh, as editorial director here at the school, I get to tell the stories of public health. 
best job ever. So now public health, as you know, covers the big picture. We look at the population level view, we look at data, evidence, policy. Today's event reminds us that behind every number is a human being. And as Laura reminds us, everyone has his or her own story to tell. So we're looking forward to hearing those today. Uh, my mission at the school I see is telling the stories of everyday people as well as public health professionals who work so hard to make a difference in improving health across populations. So I'm a huge fan of stories. Stories inform us. Stories unite us. Stories can make things happen. So we recognize that here at the Bloomberg School and share stories through all of our publications, through the website, through the magazine, as well as Global Health Now. And if you don't know Global Health Now, please check out globalhealthnow.org. I'm editor of it. Check it out. Um, and if you want to hear more about it, ask me later. I will talk your ear off about it. So enough from me. Let's, uh, you want to hear the real stories from the storytellers. Um, later in the program, we will invite a couple of you up. So be thinking of your story ideas. And our first storyteller is Sonia Sarkar. She currently serves as Chief Policy and Engagement Officer for the Baltimore City Health Department. She's a proud product of Johns Hopkins with a bachelor's, master's, and a doctorate in progress from the school. Fun fact about Sonia, as a child, she lived down the hill from MC Hammer, if you remember MC Hammer <laughs> and Hammer Time, uh, a fact that she tries to honor by busting into 80s dance moves whenever possible. Sonia. Like right you. now? Yeah. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Uh, that was not part of the instructions that Laura gave us. I'm just going to put that out there. Uh, so as the daughter of two Indian immigrants, I wish I could say that I grew up determined to break stereotypes. But to be honest with you, I spent half my life really wanting to be a doctor. Um, actually, if I'm really honest about it, I spent half my life wanting to be both an engineer and a doctor, which is even worse. Um, so as you can imagine, Hopkins was my dream school. And I showed up at the Homewood campus 11 years ago ready to make my parents proud. Now, thankfully for patients everywhere, you're welcome, I found out very quickly that I was terrible both at physics and biochem and can't really do anything that requires even a small amount of hand-eye coordination. So you're very welcome world. I decided to save lives by actually not going into the medical profession. <laughs> um, but I did realize at that time that for the first time in my young life, I had to really grapple with what I wanted to do. So enter public health. I stumbled across public health literally. I accidentally walked into a symposium that was happening on campus. And all of a sudden, this topic that I had only kind of vaguely associated with avian flu and fluoride in the water came to life for me. What I loved about public health was that it was healthcare turned inside out. It's this idea that health is driven not just by what happens inside of us, but also everything that surrounds us. So our lives, our communities, our societies. It made sense to me, and I fell hard. Um, but like with any initial infatuation, soon that romance gave way to questions. And I remember being in class after class where my professors would talk about how Baltimore, the place that we were living in and learning in, has some of the poorest health outcomes in the country. And yet, we have one of the best healthcare institutions in the country, this one. So what was missing? It was a question that bothered me again and again. And I remember when I finally made that call to my parents to break to them the tragic news of my career sabotage, there was a long pause on the other end of the line. And both of them said, sorry, what is public health? I realized that I didn't really know myself. And I can remember the two moments that really sort of clarified this field for me. The first one came when I started working with Health Leads, which is a national social enterprise that connects patients to the things that they need to be healthy, things like job or, a, or heat in the winter. And what Health Leads does is they really plug in that missing piece of the puzzle, or at least they did for me. It's this idea that what's missing from healthcare is public health. It's this thought that when we prescribe antibiotics, we also need a prescription for life, food to take that antibiotic with, or transportation to go and get that antibiotic. So health leads defined what public health is for me. But it was a totally different incident that defined what public health is to me. 
A couple of years ago, as I was working for Health Leads, I was on the JHMI shuttle. I used to ride it every day for years, as many of you do now, from the Homewood campus down here to the public health campus. And I remember it was this like bright, sweltering Baltimore day, the kind we've had too many of this summer. And I was looking out the window, and we came up on this track that's at the center of Central Ave and Monument. The field was patchy because it had been so hot that summer, and there was a group of teenagers that were goofing around on the lawn like kids do on hot summer days. And I remember it was the mid-2000s, so I had my headphones in, and um, Rihanna's umbrella was playing. And as that Ella, Ella, Ella refrain that you can never get out of your head uh, reached its peak, I watched as a skinny kid, yellow t-shirt, high tops, came up behind the group that was on the lawn and reached for a gun that was in his waistband. A shot rang out. On the bus, it was total chaos. People were yelling, call 911, what just happened? What are we looking at? The bus driver was furious. Sit down, he said, sit down. My job is to get you to the medical campus. Sit down. And so the bus rolled on. And when we reached our destination, this school, we filed off and disappeared into our classrooms, our offices, our laboratories. Except that moment kept playing again and again in my head. I felt sadness and surprise and frustration. But most of all, I felt angry. I felt angry with myself because I knew that although I lived here in Baltimore, I wasn't yet a part of it and it wasn't yet a part of me. See, I knew in my head that what I had seen that day was the result of forces much larger than those few seconds, things we have to name, structural racism, trauma, poverty. But I also knew that I couldn't grapple with those forces in any sort of effective way unless I knew also in my soul what it was about me that drew me to those things. I am a proud, proud product, as you heard, of Hopkins Public Health. With Baltimore, it's shaped pretty much every aspect of my identity. But I'm other things too. I am a brown kid on a white bus riding into East Baltimore day after day, physically protected and extraordinarily privileged. I'm a girl who loves this city but is from the Texas suburbs. And I'm someone who is fiercely committed to health justice, but still grappling with what that means in terms of being a true partner, being a champion, being a real ally. So the question that I asked myself again and again, my parents were visiting a couple days ago, and um, that, you know, that, that idea that they had posed, what is public health, it's still something that I think about all the time. And for me, the answer is simple. Public health is action. It's doing what we know is right. It's actually enabling us to grapple with those root causes of violence. It's the reason that I came back to the city to work at the extraordinary Baltimore City Health Department where every day we're putting that public health knowledge into action. We're actually taking steps to make sure that we're not just observing and analyzing from afar because I never want to be a bystander to health inequity like I was that day. Defining the work that we do and why we do is incredibly hard and ever-evolving. There's not really a clear finish line. But here at this school and in this community, we have been working at that for the past 100 years because we know that that's what public health is worth fighting for. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sonia. That was a fantastic moment connecting uh, one specific moment with the legacy here of the School of 100 Years of Public Health. So thank you very much for that. Our next uh, storyteller is Art Cohen, a public health advocate. Though retired, he remains actively engaged with the Baltimore community and beyond. He is building support for a modern streetcar line along North Avenue first, and then one in West Baltimore and East Baltimore. He also works with a global network of organizations advocating for more sanitation and water access and opposing efforts to privatize these public utilities. Please welcome. Art Cohen. Many years ago, in the last century, I was 
the HIV prevention director in a large city health department. These were the times, these were times when um, medical treatment for AIDS was at an early stage. So we relied heavily on prevention, particularly the methods of the use of condoms and clean needles. Although um, condoms were provided free of charge to local health departments, most people bought them in pharmacies around town. In the course of my work, uh, I noticed that um, one large pharmacy chain that was located throughout the city and um, in neighborhoods, uh, low-income neighborhoods particularly, was charging much more for its condoms than all the others. And uh, I, wa I looked in on this process for a period of uh, two years, and finally I'd had enough. And I thought, what can I do? So I decided to write a letter to the CEO of that pharmacy chain at their corporate headquarters with a copy to the local Better Business Bureau. And um, uh, I got the approval of my boss, sent off the letter, and this is what I said. Um, over the past two years, I've noticed that uh, your pharmacy uh, stores charge a lot more for condoms than others in the city. Um, uh, just two weeks ago, uh, I priced a dozen Trojan condoms, which is a pretty well-known name, uh, at just under $10. However, right across the street at another drugstore, the same item cost $6. So you were charging 70% more. Um, just to be sure about this, at the last meeting of the American Public Health Association, which I attended, I went up to the Trojan exhibition booth, and I talked with a representative there, and I told him about this price. Oh, he said, that must be a misprice. Our normal uh, retail charge is about $6. So anyway, I think that you and other pharmacy companies have a social duty to put and keep in place uh, responsible pricing for condoms. That's the gist of the letter. Two weeks later, I'm sitting in my office, and the director of health appears and says, Art, I'm sorry, you're going to have to go. I said, what? Why? Because the mayor was displeased with your letter. That pharmacy chain is a major contributor. Um, well, I said, um, if you look right behind you, there's the personnel office with my personnel record for the last almost four years, and there's nothing in there to justify this kind of personnel action. However, if you don't want me as your HIV prevention director, I'm just crazy enough that I want to go on working in this department doing public health. So he left saying he needed a couple of days to think about it. The very next day, I was called into his deputy's office for 45 very uncomfortable minutes to discuss the letter. I said, look, what was wrong with what was in the letter? I was trying to get better pricing for condoms, which is essential. Uh, condoms are an essential device in our work you know, here in HIV prevention. What was wrong with that? I was doing my job. Yes, he said, but Art, you went public. I said, what do you mean I went public? He said, you sent a copy to the Better Business Bureau, and you're going to have to leave. Something happened in that office, physically, to me, that had never happened before in my life and has never happened since. On its own, my nose began to bleed profuse, profusely. Anyway, a, a week later, I said goodbye to my staff. However, I was very lucky because two of my close friends and associates in the department were able to arrange for me to be hired back within three months not doing HIV prevention work, at a 20% cut in salary. And I made not my mind then and there, if I was going to go forward in public health, I probably wasn't going to do it in that particular department. I'd have to find another department. So in the course of the next two years, while I was working there, I looked for work. And I was able to find a job as a director of health somewhere else and served in that position for 
eight years, reminding myself that no good deed goes unpunished, even when you're working to protect the public's health. Thank you. Thank you, Art. Um, I love the story of taking evidence into action and the reminder that public health does not come without a price. So, so thank you for sharing that inspiring story. Our next storyteller is David Van Kuhnley, a fourth year graduate student in the Department of Mental Health at the school. In addition to his academic research and professional activities, David has been a performing artist, including vocal theater performance, African storytelling, African drumming for over 20 years. He is co-founder and primary facilitator of Discover Me, Recover Me, an intervention program that uses African oral tradition to aid in recovery from societal traumas. Please welcome David Fenkuma. So my journey into public health started about 2009 when I uh, finished my undergrad in Maryland. Uh, I got introduced to research uh, before my senior year uh, at Rutgers. At first, I thought research was sitting in a lab all day doing a bunch of dorky stuff. It wasn't for me. Um, <laughs> but it really kind of hit home how all that work could translate to a lot of the issues that I see in my hometown, which is Baltimore, Maryland. So I had been talking to a number of professors, academics, researchers for quite a while. I had a job as a research analyst, and then I went uh, to work for the federal government. Learn from this person, that person, they said, oh, you can do this, you can do that, clinical psychology, social psychology, social work, blah, 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 blah. It wasn't until I got to Hopkins and I ran into a professor by the name of Deborah Furholden, who told me exactly what I needed to do. First thing she said was getting two master's degrees is dumb. This is what she said. You need to get a PhD in public health and a master's in social work. And I said, okay. <laughs> I'm working on one of them, not the other, but you know, the PhD in, in the PhD in public health is what I'm working on. So um, I developed a very good relationship with her and it continues to this day. She's off at Michigan State helping them out in Flint. Uh, so she's she is she's doing it, she's doing it big. And uh, I really appreciate the relationship I developed with her, uh, even I was as I was deciding what I wanted to do uh, for graduate school. And I uh, got to work with her on some research and just really develop a very good working and personal relationship. So I left my $70,000 job at Social Security uh, in 2013 to be a $22,000 a year broke grad student. <laughs> uh, so of course I had to celebrate. Uh, went to Cancun, went to St. Martin, and two weeks before I start the biggest journey of my life, I found out I'm going to be a father. And yeah, I, I was freaking out a little bit. Um, I, told, I told my girlfriend, I, I don't think this is a good idea. And you know, I, I knew what she would say, no, we having this baby. So I said, okay, we having this baby. Okay, <laughs> and I talked to Dr. Ferholder and I'm ready to jump off a ledge. I'm like, I, I can't do this, I gotta get a job, I gotta take care of this life, I can ba barely take care of my own. And she really calmed me down and she told me how she, as a doctoral student, had her first child at Hopkins and how, if anything, this was the best time to have a kid. So I, I really appreciated that and that really solidified the relationship that we had beyond mentor-mentee. It was closer than that. So I'm going through my first year of my PhD, as most of y'all know, it's hell. You know, I'm here all day into the night and then I go home and have to take care of a pregnant girlfriend. Whatever she needs, I gotta take care of it. We gotta get the house ready for this new life that's coming into the world. So Monday, March 24th, 2014, at exactly 6 o'clock p.m., Cruz Matisse Rodolfo Ezekiel Idulti Oluwa Olanre Waju Irepo Oluwa Ayobami Adigun Abibola Fakunle was born. Yeah, he was a big deal. <laughs> Everybody had to get a stake in that name. I'm the only person in the world that knows his name, actually. <laughs> um, he was born. First day of fourth term. I'm delivering my son into the world. Spend the whole first week of fourth term in the hospital. That was crazy. But I, I wouldn't change it for the world. I still remember telling my parents, terrified. Dr. Furholden was supposed to be there. She never made it. Holding up the sonogram and saying, this is your grandson. And the first thing I saw was my father smile. And I knew I'd be okay. So I'm still going through fourth term. It's, it's a lot of work, as you expect. And I had a lot of late nights. And I would come home, and this little boy 
would be there at the door. And he'd smile at me. As if I was the only thing he was waiting for that day. Now, me getting into public health was about making sure that people who look like me have the best opportunity to be the best version of themselves. Um, I, I make no bones about it. I'm a black male from East Baltimore. I guarantee you there aren't very many black males from East Baltimore at this prestigious institution. I told my department the first day I showed up, I pointed out the window and I said, I live here. I was born and raised here. And my only goal is to come back 10 to 15 years from now and make sure there's more people that look like me in this room. Now they got some work to do. I'm still the only black male pre-doc in my department. I ain't happy about that, but they keep hearing from me. Um, so when I wear a shirt that says I am black history, I am black history. But having, having my son Cruz Matisse really brought it home. It was no longer theoretical. It was no longer hypothetical. All the opportunities that I've had in my life, despite being a black male from East Baltimore, despite all the pitfalls, despite all the challenges, the barriers, we talk about institutional racism, we talk about poverty, we talk about redlining, we talk about segregation, we talk about, let's be honest, a piss poor educational system. We talk about food deserts, food swamps. I had a number of opportunities that gave me uh, a brilliant education, knowledge of self, uh, understanding of who I am, art and cultural understanding, and that's made me this dynamic individual that doesn't just rely on research but relies on all his talents to, to make this city better. And yeah, this is my city, so I care a hell of a lot. But I care even more now uh, because everything that I want to do, I can look into his eyes. Everything I want him to be, I can look into his eyes. All I want in this world is for my son and however and many other kids I have. <laughs> I'm on one right now. But so I focus on Cruz Matisse. Everything that I want in this world is for him as a black male, as a Latino male, to be the best version of himself. So my my journey in public health is never ending. It won't in until I'm exhausted and until God calls me home. Um, because for him, for any other child, they deserve the opportunity to be the best that they can be. And I've told Hopkins this and I tell anyone who listens to me, if you give them that opportunity to be the best version of themselves, watch how better this world will be. David, thank you so much. As a as a father, uh, I don't have any words to add to that. I mean, what, what, that's what we want for every, all of our children, and I wish you the very best in all that you do, and the best for Cruz as well. Our next storyteller is uh, an, a personal hero of mine, and probably many of us here in the room. Sue Baker is an epidemiologist specializing in injury prevention. She was the first director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Injury Research and Policy. Her research includes motor vehicle occupant and pedestrian deaths among children and adults, fatalities related to aviation, motorcycles, and heavy trucks, carbon monoxide poison, and many, many other issues. A licensed private pilot, Sue, and her, uh, through her research, um, has done analyses of crashes in the Colorado Rockies and research on commuter, commuter aircraft crashes and on crashes of instructional flights. Please welcome Susan Baker. In the summer of 1971, I was in Rio de Janeiro doing research on pedestrian fatalities. I wanted to compare that to research I'd done at the medical examiner's office here in Baltimore on pedestrian fatalities in Baltimore. One thing that was clear right away was that it was much easier to be killed as a pedestrian there in Rio than in Baltimore. In Baltimore, 
You had to be very old or very young or very drunk to be killed as a pedestrian. In Rio de Janeiro, anybody, working, uh, young people, uh, anybody, they did not have, uh, it was sort of almost a cross-section of the population that was getting killed. There were many roads, highways that had been built with, uh, built through neighborhoods where if you wanted to go see your cousin, you had to get across some major highway. If you didn't want to run across the road, you had to walk a ways to a pedestrian bridge and climb 30 or 40 steps carrying your briefcase or your baby or your bicycle. Uh, it was not easy to cross the street. So a lot of people picked what they thought was the easy way and just ran across the street between the cars and not all of them made it. Well, one day after work, I went to the beach. I hadn't done that before and I didn't know much about how to, I was going to get home. But it turned out that in order to get home, I had to cross a highway. It had four lanes of traffic in this direction, four lanes of traffic in this direction. And I was not about to do what everybody else was doing, which was sort of running between the cars, because there was a uh, tunnel under the road that was supposed to make it easy for people to cross safely. So I took the steps down to the tunnel, and when I got there, what did I see? Knee-deep water. Well, you know, that did it. Back up the stairs, and... Uh, the first half of the highway was okay because the, all the traffic was going, uh, the only traffic was going into the city. It was five o'clock in the afternoon and people could run across between the cars and I did too. And then got to the second part of the highway with four lanes of traffic, heavy traffic coming out of the city at five o'clock. Other people were doing it. I could not. So I turned around, I was going to retrace my steps as quickly as possible. I looked to make sure there was nothing coming, but a tree branch was obscuring my view. I didn't realize it, but there was a car that was coming straight for me. I got out into the second lane and realized this car was bearing down at me. Recently, I learned that my students here at the school had a nickname for me. They called me Fearless Baker. <laughs> I think because I wouldn't take any guff from people and because I, I didn't mind going up against the manufacturers to testify for airbags. And anyway, that day I was not fearless. I was scared skinny. <laughs> well, I didn't know whether to go forward or backward or stay where I was. I jumped backwards and the car missed me by probably a foot. Uh, certainly the scariest thing that ever happened to me. But I learned something from it. I learned that if, and, and not only from what happened to me, but from the fact that everybody else was avoiding the water, which I eventually waded through and got to the other side. But people thought I was nuts to do that rather than run across the road. Uh, but I learned that if you want people to take the safe way to get across the road, you have to make the safe way the easy way, the way that will appeal to them. Otherwise, they're going to take what they think is the best way, and it can be as dangerous as all heck. And uh, that year, there were 200 people killed in Rio on one stretch of highway, because they didn't want to go the more difficult way that involved all the steps and so on, and they thought that the quick, for them, that the quickest way was just to run across the road. So that same uh, lesson that the safest way must be the easiest way applies to almost anything that you want people to do. 
whether it's the way you carve something, the way you, the route that you take when you drive your car, no matter what you're doing, the safe way, if you want people to take it, must be the easiest way. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Uh, so I have to tell my own uh, fearless Sue story. Uh, we were doing a photo shoot at the Baltimore City Medical Examiner's Office for a story. And uh, we were waiting to go in. And then we realized that we were going to have to walk through several autopsies to get to the room that we needed to be in. And <clears throat> I, I can faint at the sight of my own blood and others. And uh, so I, I went up to Sue and I said, uh, you know, Sue, we, maybe we, uh, we don't need to do this. Maybe, um, are, are you okay with this? <laughs> Hoping she would say, oh yeah, maybe we shouldn't do this. She said, oh, of course. And she started walking right in. And so, <laughs> so I had no choice but to follow. The horror, the horror. Uh, okay, we are now into our audience participation section. So if we could raise the lights, um, we will be choosing a couple of you if you wanna raise your hands. But first, let me tell you the, uh, the ground rules here. You have uh, three minutes to tell a story. Uh, we would ask that you keep it to within the three minutes. And if you see the little kitty picture here, you can, thank you, Jess. Uh, that signifies it's time to stop talking. So you can maybe wrap things up within 20 seconds or so, uh, but that's sort, of, that's sort of it. When you come up, please just say your name and affiliation and jump right into your story. And so now we'll open it up. Uh, who wants to tell a story? Come on, don't make me call on somebody. Fantastic. Noor and the gentleman right behind Lily. Sorry, Lily, you were already focused on today. So please, uh, Noor, come up first. And sir, if you could come up and stand right here. Do we need anything else? Any other instructions? OK. Okay, you guys can hear me? Okay. Um, in 2012, I got a phone call and I had a friend who was in Damascus uh, under bombing and he said, we need your help. And he sent me a picture of a child drinking out of a sewer. And he said, this is what's happening in Syria. These, these kids, they don't have clean water and you're the only almost microbiologist that we know. Please come as soon as you can. So um, to the chagrin of my parents, I got on a plane uh, to go to a war zone. And that's where I found myself in March 2013. And I was instructed to do a disease analysis, a risk analysis. I was instructed to say, or to disclose what I saw. What did I, what did I think was going to happen in Syria because of what was happening in Syria? And I saw many, many things. But I also saw a girl named Samar, who has the same name as my mother. I saw a girl named Katya, who was a student in the school that we had opened. I saw a girl named Amal, who waited outside of my tent every day, starting at sunrise, to spend time with me and follow me around. And I saw a girl named Afro, and she was 11 and would not let go of me. And I gave my report. I said, I, I see cholera. I, I see typhoid. I see many, many horrible infectious diseases coming our way. And I, I wrote my report. I came back to the, to the United States. And I don't know where Afro or Summer or MLR today. Are they in Syria? Are they in Turkey? Are they in Jordan? And I always think about them. But I, I bring this up because in public health, our work is never done. We see very, very zoomed out problems, but they zoom in to these little girls, these little children, who just want to go to school and just want clean water and just want to have the same future that we all want for ourselves and for our children. 
And so back in Florida, my home, getting ready to go to class on a regular day, I pour myself some cereal and I totally lose my appetite because Afro doesn't have the same cereal as me. She doesn't have anything for breakfast and neither does Samar and neither does Amal. But do these people who have so little know that they can offer us so much? Do they know that they give us purpose and meaning and add so many beautiful things to our own lives? Because public health is, as was mentioned earlier, a somewhat nebulous concept, right? We, we protect health, we make health, we, we give suggestions, we do a lot of things. But we also change lives while people change our own lives. So thank you. Thank you, and uh, I'll dispense with the PowerPoint. Uh, after uh, spending uh, most of a career in the uh, Navy, where I was involved in uh, radiation uh, occupational protection, I uh, resigned my Navy commission and moved to the Public Health Service as a commissioned officer, and uh, was uh, provided with the opportunity to work in uh, occupational safety and health through NIOSH and OSHA. And uh, one of my uh, first uh, assignments was to look into how ethylene oxide, a, a chemical used to sterilize medical devices and equipment, was being used in the healthcare community. And uh, we conducted uh, measurements, surveys, and so on in uh, a number of hospitals and found that uh, there was tremendous exposure of personnel performing the sterilization of the equipment. And um, the chemical had newly been recognized as mutagenic and was suspected of being carcinogenic to humans. It managed to kill every microorganism that it was ever tested on, which is, of course, what you'd want with an effective sterilizing agent. But uh, one of the contacts that I uh, attempted to make was to get into a hospital uh, to make some measurements. And uh, I won't mention the name of the hospital. OSHA has uh, agreed to hold the hospitals uh, anonymous. But I was told to uh, contact the director, uh, Sister Marie. So I phoned her and introduced myself and said we'd like to come in and uh, find out how you're sterilizing your instruments and equipment and uh, medical devices that are being implanted. And she stopped me and she said, uh, young man, you must not be aware but in this hospital, we perform no sterilizations. <laughs> uh, that was the gist of my story, but if I still have a few more. <laughs> a, a, a few more moments uh, after uh, NIOSH and OSHA, I moved to the Food and Drug Administration, where uh, Another nonprofit group, yes, where uh, we uh, got a chance to look at uh, condoms and uh, exam gloves. It was in the early days of the AIDS epidemic, and uh, I went to purchase some condoms, about $300 worth, to test in the laboratory. And I'll save the rest of that story uh, for another time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joyce. Thank you so much, Noor and Zori, for your, your stories. And actually, we've got a break here. We're coming to the uh, wrapping up the program. Uh, we have a few more uh, storytellers to go that are fantastic. And we also are going to hear for a few minutes right now from Mark Meadows doing an original composition. Sure, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm going to do a quick original uh, entitled, What Would You Do? This is off of my latest album. Hope you enjoy it. Awesome stories, everybody. I'm loving it.
So many people taught not to believe With the weight of the world How can they achieve? Setting our fear Displaying their pain Walk mile in their shoes With nobody to turn to Think of what you'd go through If nobody believed in you What would you do? With nothing to lose So what would you do? With nothing to lose They were dealt the wrong hand And everyone knows A path was paved It's all up to us, yeah We can right this wrong Walk a mile in their shoes With nobody to turn to Think of what you go through If nobody believed in What would you do with nothing to lose? Now, what would you do with nothing to choose? So what would you do with nothing to lose? So what would you do So what would you do? Thank you, thank you, Mark. That was fantastic. And, uh, and I believe I caught one line in there that's so appropriate for today for public health. It's all up to us. We can, write, this wrong. We can write this wrong. Perfect. Thank you. All right. We're moving on to our next storyteller. Uh, as the U.S. manager of the FIA Foundation, Natalie Drazen is working in the crossroads of global road safety advocacy, communications, and policy. She's been working in road safety since she was an undergrad. Um, and a fun fact uh, about Natalie, she also biked across the country and says that, if anything, that will teach you about the need for better roads. <laughs> so please welcome Natalie Drazen. Thank you so much for having me here today. And I'm going to tell you how I fell in love with road safety as an undergrad. As an undergrad, I was an Alpha Phi, a sorority, which shocks a couple people, but that's okay. If any of you were in Greek life, you might have been forced to play powder puff football. 
I got dragged into this. And the night before the game, we had a fundraiser. It was October 16th, 2009. And I walked to the fundraiser with my friend, good friend to this day, Anna. While we were at the fundraiser, Anna got a call that her little sister in the sorority, Miriam, was crossing St. Paul Street from the Marylander going to the fundraiser when a drunk driver hit her. He had 17 prior DUIs. And a fellow sorority sister had found Miriam face down, her shoes flung far up the road, and called 911. Anna went to the hospital to be with Miriam. The rest of us went to the sorority president's house to make get well cards. Later that night, as we were in the middle of making get well cards, the sorority president sat us down and said, I have to tell you something. Miriam's not going to make it. And I cannot describe to you what it's like to watch the ripple effect of the news that one of your friends has died spread across 80 girls in one room. Some girls were sobbing. Some girls were sitting there in shock. I happened to be sitting next to my own little sister, and we sort of held each other in disbelief that this could have been anyone, including one of us. Her parents were called from Chicago to fly in to say goodbye to their 20-year-old daughter before she was taken off life support. The next morning, October 17, 2009, I woke up and my sadness was overcome by anger. And it was the most wonderful anger that I've ever felt because feeling it reminded me that I was alive and I was lucky to feel angry. I remember I went for a walk that morning and it was raining and I specifically did not bring my umbrella because I wanted to feel what it was like to have rain on my skin to remind me that I was alive. It was anger, not just that a 20-year-old girl, who, by the way, I wasn't particularly close with, a 20-year-old girl who was studying Lou Gehrig's disease at Hopkins, who had a promising future in front of her, was killed crossing the street. And you know what? It didn't even matter that Miriam was smart and had a bright future. It just mattered that she would never get older. She would never get married. She would never have a child. And she would always be 20 years old. Now, one thing that I love about this institution is that we take our ivory tower and we bring it to the streets. So that week, I happened to be in Jan Vernick's Issues in Injury and Violence Prevention class. And I went up to Jan after, and I said, I think you heard about what happened at Homewood. I want to make sure this never happens to ever, anyone ever again. Let's build a pedestrian bridge from the Marylander, or you know, the dorms to campus. And Jan, who has decades of experience on me, and is one of the kindest, most diplomatic people you'll ever meet, told me why this was a ridiculous idea. <laughs> And he pointed to exactly what Sue said before, which is, if you don't build the safest way as the easiest way, no one will use it. So nobody was going to use that pedestrian walkway, and the homeowners association wouldn't go for it because it's an eyesore. But Jan had a better idea. He said, why don't you go lobby and testify for ignition interlock legislation in Annapolis, and why don't you bring together a group of people who can make the streets around Homewood safer? And I said, I'm just a college student. I don't know what I'm doing. He said, I'll help you. And he did. And I'll also mention that Sue was one of those professors in that class. And that was where the dream to become the Sue Baker of drunk driving prevention was born, <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of an impossible feat, but it's still there. Anyway, with Jan's help, I did exactly that. I I'm sorry for the reconstruction that has probably messed with your transit. It wasn't entirely my fault. It was a group of people. But the roads around Hopkins are safer. And with a couple years of work, we did get a compromise on legislation in Annapolis. And we're able to bring 70 students there to stand up for Miriam. All of this feeds into what I do today. And one of my favorite projects that I work on is Safer Routes to School for Children in America with a vision that all children around the world have a safe journey to school 
by 2030. Now, I don't tell this story very often. This is actually my first time telling it in depth to a group of people. And that's because it's not my story to tell. It's Miriam's story to tell. But Miriam's not here. And I urge you to think about all the other people that aren't here to tell their stories and what you can do to help them. I would also say that once you find that passion, even if it's born out of a tragedy, don't let it die. I didn't think that I could make a difference out of it. I didn't think that it would translate into professors here, like Steve Terrett, helping me teach a class about drunk driving prevention at his clinic at Hopkins, which I urge you to look at. But I did, because people here are the ones who can help you make a change. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you for sharing that story with us today. <clears throat> Our next storyteller is Ahmed Hassoun. He's currently a research associate in the Department of Epidemiology here at the school. He's working on several projects related to cardiovascular disease and cancer. Prior to joining Hopkins, he worked in international development projects in 35 countries. And Ahmed, I understand uh, that you have uh, something in common with Joe Frazier, George Foreman, and Sonny Liston. Uh, as a child, you were punched in the face by Muhammad Ali. <laughs> Thank you. Please welcome Adam McPherson. That was actually a true story <laughs> in Baghdad. So uh, I, I was born in Iraq, in Baghdad, in, in 1981. Um, I lived through the Iraq-Iran war that lasted for eight years, and then the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, and then the UN sanction, and the US invasion, and then the aftermath of that invasion. Uh, and I survived that with my family. Uh, I was lucky to be part of a state-sponsored program by Saddam regime for uh, people with very high uh, intelligence coefficients, where we go through a series of testing, and if we pass, we can actually jump in into school with our own uh, specialty choice. So at age 17, um, I was actually a medical student at Baghdad School of Medicine at age 17 in 1998, hoping to finish medical school with a license at uh, age 20. Um, however, in 2003, the US invasion happens and my school was destroyed and I lost my uh, medical education. But that year I started my first public health job, which was with the US Army 2nd 82nd Airborne. I was working in a public health project with the US Army at that time. Uh, gradually, I transitioned back to my school as it was fixed, and I got my medical degree. Uh, the plan was to do my residency in Baghdad, close to my family, close to my friends. Uh, but because of my affiliation with the US government and, and for other undisclosed reasons, me and my professor, who was a neurophysicist in, in Baghdad School of Medicine, were targeted by a terrorist group. And that day, I lost him. He actually died in front of me. I survived the attack because I was told that my head was in the right angle and the bullet didn't go through my skull. It just angled back. So a decision was made that I have to do my residency away from Baghdad for safety after that attack. Uh, so they were I was transferred to a province in the south. It's a very tribal community, and there is a hospital. That hospital has a 200 bed. It's chronically understaffed, chronically under-equipped, and I'm a stranger in that province. I know nobody. Uh, I look different than any other people there. Uh, one of those days, uh, which, by the way, in that hospital, it was completely normal that you end up alone in that hospital for a few days caring for 200 vet hospitals, including the emergency department, by yourself, because we were chronically understaffed. One of those days, I was in the emergency room, and I had a patient who was a young man who had a car accident. Uh, he was fine, except like a small scratch in his hand, which we put a very nice Band-Aid on it. Uh, he was whining a lot, but he was fine. And I didn't know who he was. I just treated him just like any other patient. And he was under observation. At that time, the ambulance arrived, and they deliver a kid who was six to eight years old. 
and all his, both of his arms, both of his legs were blown away in a bomb. I tried to save that kid, but I, I couldn't. Uh, the kid was in a very bad shape, and, and he passed away. During that time, a second, a third, and a fourth kid arrived to the emergency department. All of them have similar injuries, either without an arm, or either without a leg, or without even both on both legs. Uh, so I lost the second, and I lost the third kid as well. Uh, all of them were around six, seven, eight years old. Later I learned that they were playing out in the street and there was a roadside bomb exploded while they were playing uh, in that street. However, the fourth kid was fighting back and we were fighting hard to, to save that kid and I was squeezing the blood, squeezing the fluid into his veins and, and trying to save him, but he was bleeding. And we made a decision that we have to transfer him to another hospital. So I told one of the nurses to prepare the ambulance and I will take the kid and I will drive him to uh, the other hospital so we can do an emergency surgery for him. However, if you remember that guy with a Band-Aid, turns out that guy is the son of the tribal leader of that province, one of the most powerful tribe. And the, tr the emergency department was filled with more than 100 people, uh, mainly the tribal leader himself, the chief, with all the entourage, all the bodyguards, with their guns, by the way, inside the hospital. At that time, it was a time of lack of governance. It was after the US invasion. And uh, his father demanded that I have to give my attention to his young man. I explained to him that there's nothing wrong with him. He's, he's fine. Actually, you can take him home. And I have to take this kid to the other hospital to save his life. He said, no, you have to care for my son. You cannot just leave the emergency room without caring for my son. I was looking at the other side, there was the parents of that kid. They, they looked very poor from the way they, they dressed and they didn't say anything. They didn't even ask me to take care of that kid. So at that moment, uh, I was trying to take the kid to the ambulance. They blocked my way in the emergency department and I had to make a decision. So what I did is uh, I grabbed the tribal leader from his shirt and I punched him in the face. <laughs> I did that. I punched him so hard. At that time, a big fight started in the emergency departments. Hundreds of people punching each other. <laughs> Nobody knows which side they are. <laughs> even, I swear, even women, they were punching each other. Like that. I, at that moment, I didn't hear anything. It was a silent moment for me. I was focused on that kid. Um, I gradually sneaked myself out of that fight. It was still a fight. I took the kid into the ambulance and I drove him to that hospital. And then I returned back at night to the hospital and I found a lot of people waiting outside carrying guns. And I learned that there's a death penalty on me because I punched the tribal leader of that tribe. I was able to sneak into the hospital because I was in the ambulance. Uh, and I actually stayed in that hospital for three months, stranded for protection by the security guard because they were outside for three months waiting for me to go out to, to be killed. Um, I didn't care if they will sneak in and kill me at that time. All what I care about is that actually that kid made it and he's alive. Uh, my message is not to promote violence, but <laughs> it's, it's just to give you an idea about how it is different to practice medicine and public health in, in a setting like Iraq. Uh, and how public health is about making the right bold decision at the right time, at the right moment, and make sure that you are ready to take the consequences of that, that decision. Following that, there were many events happened. I was transferred as a compromise to, to stay alive. Uh, later, I was kidnapped, I was shot, I was car bombed, and many, many events happened. Uh, but all of it led me to what I am today. So, thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, I do believe that's the first time I've ever at the School of Public Health heard someone say, and I grabbed the tribal leader and punched him in the face. <laughs> we don't hear that often here. Um, now, before our, our last speaker, um, you should know that I come from a long line of Southern storytellers, and so my DNA prevents me from missing a chance to tell a story. So I'm gonna do this in one minute. 
Uh, and it, my story pales before all of the stories you've heard today and before the final story you will hear, but it is a Bloomberg School story. It's a Johns Hopkins story. Um, this May, I had the opportunity to cover uh, the World Health Assembly in Geneva for Global Health Now. Uh, on the first day, I went in very, very early, got my ID, long day of alternately fascinating and stultifying meetings, and uh, finally got home. I couldn't afford, of course, to stay in Geneva, so I stayed across the border in this tiny town in France. Finally got home, back to the hotel, and it was uh, about 10 o'clock at night, raining, completely dark out, and I was starving, low blood sugar, and I had to get something to eat. I walk down the street, I find that there are only two places open, this sort of dodgy looking cafe, and then I hear up above there's a pizza restaurant on the second floor, and I say, I'll go up there, that looks good. I'm, I'm starving, I'm not gonna look, look any further. I walk in, it's completely packed, there are no seats available, every, every table is taken. I'm like, oh my God, am I ever gonna get to eat tonight? And then I look over and sitting at the table there is Bob Blum, who is, he is uh, chair of the Department of uh, Population, Family, and Reproductive Health. And I couldn't believe it. I say, Bob! And he like couldn't, he couldn't like, you know, kind of facilitate, you know, understand why I'm, what, he says, what are you doing here? <laughs> and so I explained what I was doing. Uh, I had a wonderful dinner with him. He paid for the pizza. It was fantastic. <laughs> and uh, and we, were, we, we talked for about 20 minutes about how crazy it was that, you know, the two of us found each other in this tiny town in France. And he said, Brian, Hopkins is everywhere. <laughs> and so I want to leave you with that, that story. And now I've, I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK. I want to introduce our final speaker for today, or storyteller. Daniel Webster is professor of health policy and management, where he directs the Center for Gun Policy and Research and co-directs the Center for the Prevention of Youth Violence. Dr. Webster is one of the nation's top researchers studying gun violence prevention, and his work has had impact from the White House to state houses across the U.S., city agencies, and community nonprofits. In 1993, he developed one of the first courses on violence prevention in a school of public health, and he continues teaching it today, till today. So Daniel Webster. Please welcome. The, the first lesson in, in my class is do not punch tribal leaders in the face. Uh, so you must have missed that class. Um, I, I'm just going to tell a, a little story about my path to, to public health and try to, you know, connect the dots. Um, I've spent almost 25 years here on the faculty. Um, as a researcher, I do a very applied research. Um, but, and, and I make connections in, in communities and with law enforcement. But I myself have not been touched in, in the same kind of ways of, of much of what I study. Um, but I want to I want to sort of get back to the the, the path and um, I I grew up and I don't think I knew what public health was maybe a lot of you didn't when when you were growing up but I was intensely interested in health uh, I was probably more squeamish than Brian I knew I wasn't going to be a physician um, but I, I was I was connected to sort of the psychology and health and mostly sort of how we cope with illness and disability, and I thought that that's the path I'm on. So I'm an undergraduate, I think I'm going on a clinical uh, psychology path to do that kind of work. And then uh, I bombed my TREs, <laughs> and, and that wasn't going to happen. So I got to actually get a job. Um, and this was in the early 1980s, and, and I went back to my hometown, a uh, small community in, in Kentucky, uh, and what I was able to get, I think I uh, paid $12,000 a year as a social worker at the Department of Social Services for the state in a, in a nearby county. Um, I actually was the Department of Social Services <laughs> in this county, a uh, 21-year-old guy, uh, if you could just sort of imagine that. And my job principally, I had a caseload dealing with uh, child maltreatment uh, cases, uh, juveniles who got into trouble with the law uh, and domestic violence issues. And, um, and 
much of what a social worker, I think, is supposed to do is actually help connect people to resources to help their lives. Sadly, in the community I was serving, there was virtually no resources. I, I was almost it. But on my first uh, week of the job, um, I, I got a report from a school teacher about a little boy who had bruises all over him. And um, um, so I, I had to go investigate the case. I, I um, talked to the boy. I, I looked at um, you know, his condition and, of course, had to go talk to his, his guardian. His grandmother was his guardian. And I went to, to, to meet her in, in her home. Uh, most of the, the people I dealt with, uh, this won't be any surprise, uh, were very low income, very low education, and at a host, uh, very often at a host of mental health and substance abuse problems. This was a little different case. This was a middle class woman, business person, and um, but I had to deal with this this situation and. I started a conversation, of course, you can imagine, this is someone who was about the age of my mother at that time, uh, looking at me like a 21-year-old guy, and you're going to talk to me about how I'm dealing with my kid. But basically, she wanted me to, to see that she had a gun in her purse and that uh, she she's very uh, prepared to use it if I have any ideas about having that child removed from her care. Well, we actually had to remove that child from her care. Um, I, I didn't do it. I asked the sheriff to do it. Um, but uh, when when uh, I prepared this case uh, for for more formal uh, uh, removal, um, didn't go anywhere, uh, and uh, the, the child went back to this this woman. That was sort of my first real understanding of of sort of how class. Um, plays such an important role in public health. And much of my experience over my short span, I worked almost two years doing that, um, basically I, I was seeing all the different impediments to living health and, and, and safety, safe lives. My only resource was the public health nurse who was right across the hall from me. And that is how I literally discovered public health. But I was really looking for, so I wasn't going to be a public health nurse, but I wanted to, to think about the factors that place people at risk. Uh, during that time that, uh, you know, every day I was dealing with all of these kinds of uh, social maladies uh, with little, frankly, to offer, I was also living at home, and my mother was going through major depression. And... Um, she, she had struggled a little bit with that, but this was by, far and away her, her uh, worst episode. And um, she was in, in really not good shape and uh, relied, frankly, on me a, a great deal to help her. Um, but when she was sort of in the depths of this, was also the time that um, I was heading to public health school. Actually, it wasn't this one. I started at University of Michigan. Um, and, and so I, I, I had to leave. I was very excited about going to Ann Arbor. And, um, but I got a call, um, I think it was about four days after I was there, and I was so excited. I got a call from my dad and wanted to tell him about all the different things that, that was before me. But he said, um, Dan, uh, your, your mom drove the car into the river uh, trying to commit suicide. Thankfully, two young men rescued her. Um, she got care that she needed. She went on to live 25 more years um, of actually mostly happy life. One reason I, I want to tell a story is that I think that she lived those 25 years because she did not have ready access to a gun. I, I, I know her condition. I think she she would have not have survived. She, she would have reached for that gun, but we did not have a loaded gun available to her. Um, most of, of what I do in my work, I am showing statistical analysis, and I'm trying to convey to people uh, something that's very hard, uh, that because we see gun violence every day and we don't have the stories of people who didn't succumb to that, right? 
And uh, at least now, as, as I undertake my own studies, showing that reducing access to guns saves lives from suicide, I at least have my own story uh, of my mother. Thank you so much. You've been a terrific audience, and especially for these kinds of stories, the audience plays a crucial role. And so thank you for your attention and your engagement. I would love for us to give another round of applause for the storytellers and have them stand. They, they will all be at the reception, which is following this. So if you have questions or you want to talk with them about their story, I'm sure they'd be happy for, the, for that to happen. Thanks once again to Mark Meadows for the piano playing. That was beautiful. Um, and um, if you're interested in true personal storytelling, please come visit us at The Stoop. And thanks again to um, Jimmy Liu and Jess and Morgan and everybody for letting storytelling be part of your alumni day celebration. Thanks a lot.